Welcome back. A bunch of these FMCG stocks doing extremely well in today's trading session, most notably the Staples one. So we'll keep an eye out on that. Britannia, for instance, up around 3 odd percent. Marico has picked up from, uh, you know, the lows of trade. Nestle is doing extremely well as well. So the question is, where does it go from here on? Arnab Mitra, the India consumer analyst said Goldman Sachs joins in now. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the commentary from companies does confirm that there has been a fair amount of urban consumption slowdown. The question is, does this recover or not? Before we talk about that, you know, Arnab, uh, pleasure having you on the show today. The question is, uh, you know, uh, staples, because a lot of people, after the election results that have come in from both Jharkhand, Maharashtra, as well as earlier Haryana, the street believes that maybe populist schemes are back on track. Typically, when that happens, that is a positive for staples. What does your assessment say on this? And do you think it's a good time? Yeah, thanks uh, for having me on the show. Great to see you again. Um, so if you look at the uh, staple side of the equation, uh, there has undeniably been an urban slowdown, which most companies have spoken about. Uh, however, if you just unpack the data on urban uh, at an aggregate level, there are a lot of different trends that are there. So so obviously the absolute top end of urban, which we uh, call affluent India, which we wrote about in our report in the beginning of the year, that still remains very resilient. You know, categories like jewelry, travel, leisure, those segments have remained very, very strong. Uh, there is really a slowdown in the mass urban categories, which is where some of our FMCG names uh, come in. And there has also been a trend of down trading. So certain categories, for example, package D has seen a down trading trend. We have seen down trading in value fashion, where value fashion names are doing well. The rural side of the equation actually has been doing quite okay. You know, uh, Manglam, if, if you look at even in the last six months, uh, rural has been more resilient. Uh, we are much doing much better than last year uh, and definitely uh, has not seen a slowdown in the recent months. Uh, I think the one of the part, reasons why rural has been resilient is what you referred to, which is that in the last six months, we have seen an increase in welfare spending by state governments. In fact, our economics team had put out a piece where they quantified about one and a half lakh crores of direct cash handouts to women across eight or nine states uh, in the last six to 12 months. And that's something which is a trend that we are seeing continue. And that definitely does help uh, rural demand remain more resilient. Of course, the other part of the equation is we are probably in a good agricultural cycle. The rains have been good. Hopefully, the agricultural economy should be doing well. So I do feel rural will continue to remain resilient uh, while some of the urban slowdown could continue in the near term. Uh, Staples, honestly, is a little better off than discretionary because it does have a mix of rural and urban. And uh, we are seeing relatively resilient growth in Staples, uh, except for certain companies which have a higher dependence on urban uh, consumption. A couple of more quarters, Arnab. Firstly, good afternoon. Thank you for joining in. You know, a couple of more quarters for this urban slowdown to persist. What are your channel checks indicating? Because now we are past the festive season. A better part of the wedding season is also behind us. What has been the third quarter trend looking like on ground as per your channel checks? Yeah, so if you uh, go back into why this urban slowdown has happened, at least our analysis, our view, hmm. is that it's been driven by two very specific factors in the recent six months. One is if you look at the last 12 months, 10 of the last 12 months, food inflation has been running at more than 8%. This is significantly higher than what we have seen in the previous four, five year period, right? So that is definitely hurting disposable income for urban consumers, especially mid to low income urban consumers. The second is we've seen the slowdown in, uh, you know, uh, unsecured lending to consumers. Again, that affects the same income segment, which is low to mid income urban. Uh, now, the, the, any pickup would basically depend on these two factors reversing. Um, uh, if you look at food inflation, it's primarily driven by, driven by one thing, which is vegetables. Vegetable inflation has been extremely high in the 20s and 30s in the last few months. And uh, vegetables, as you know, is a demand supply equation. There's, it's a perishable product. If there's a slight shortfall in supply, prices move up. If supply corrects itself, prices move down also. We've seen that in history. Uh, our economics team actually does believe that we should start seeing a cooling off of food inflation somewhere in the March quarter. As the winter crop comes in, the winter agricultural cycle has been good, the rains have been good. So once that corrects, that in our in my view could be a catalyst for a gradual recovery. As we speak in the December quarter, I do not expect trends to change significantly. But we do not expect it to worsen, but it would probably not improve. And it would be somewhere in the March quarter where the catalyst would be a gradual easing of a food inflation, which leads to the urban uh, consumption starting to come back in. However, you know, the other reason, other factor in consumer staples uh, is 
has been this very sharp spike we have seen in palm oil prices in the last six months, which is impacting margins of many companies. So as you know, palm oil is used very extensively in soaps, in noodles, in biscuits, and a bunch of FMCG categories. The commodities spike has been extremely sharp in the last six months. And as it always has, uh, FMCG companies take six to eight months to pass on pricing to the consumers. So we are also seeing a margin pressure, which in our view is transitionary. And uh, once the pricing increases are taken over a six to eight month period, we've historically seen consumer margins come back to where they were. So from both those angles, in terms of an urban consumption recovery, as well as the input cost pressures going away, I would think that somewhere in the March quarter, we should start seeing uh, those two play out. And therefore, uh, it's a good time to look at some of the stocks uh, which have corrected due to both of these factors in staples. All right. And uh, come March quarter, you'll also have a uh, lot more favorable base. So maybe optically as well, growth would look a lot better uh, going forward in FI26. Uh, Arnab, you know, uh, let's get a little specific uh, on your calls that you have. One on Titan and the other one is on ITC. Titan, you say that competitive intensity perhaps in your view is largely over. I just wanted to understand what makes you think that largely because, you know, we still have others expanding their exp uh, uh, retail presence, their offerings, uh, the underlying macro trend of, uh, you know, people moving into lab-grown diamonds. And then you have new age corporates coming in as well or uh, Indriya, Reliance, uh, you know, increasing their footprint. So your thoughts on competitive intensity for Titan. And the second one is ITC. Uh, is it purely for valuations? Because, you know, other companies, uh, namely Godfrey Phillips too, over the last eight or nine quarters has consistently been gaining share in the tobacco segment. Uh, so both on ITC and Titan, your call. Yeah, uh, Manglam, I would not uh, speak specifically on individual stocks, but if I just step back and think about the jewelry industry, the jewelry industry, uh, like many consumer discretionary industries, is extremely attractive. So all these consumer discretionary industries have high headroom for growth. They play on affluent consumers. There is formalization, unorganized to organized share move. And as a natural consequence, we have seen increase in competitive intensity in many categories in the consumer discretionary side, jewelry, paints, uh, fashion Detailing. We've seen a spike in competitive intensity. So that's a reality. Competition is going to be high in these sectors as more people try to participate. Having said that, um, the industry itself is in really strong tailwinds. So the revenue growth for the overall jewelry industry is, remains extremely strong, probably one of the strongest within my coverage. Uh, we expect December quarter to also be very strong after an extremely strong March quarter. Um, gold prices recently coming off did help consumption again uh, pick up in this category after festive season. And uh, our view is that if the underlying industry trends are very strong, uh, there is room to absorb more competition. So our view is not that competition is going to ease in any way. Competition will remain high, but the industry growth is good enough to absorb uh, uh, more competition. And of course, jewelry is not a zero-sum game. There's a lot of unorganized sector and uh, all formal players could, could gain share here. Uh, on lab-grown diamonds, it's a very interesting point you raise. That's something uh, in our discussion with investors is very top of mind. Um, it's something which is not very easy to take a view on today because it depends. Each country may react very differently. Uh, but uh, the research that we have done and written about is that um, historically, what we've seen in other countries like the US is the lab-grown diamond market does become a substantial part of the diamond market. But the overall sales of diamond jewelry do not tend to drop. Uh, consumers actually uptrade the size of the stone as they move from a natural diamond to a lab diamond. And therefore, if uh, the existing players can also participate in lab-grown diamonds, which it has happened in the US, uh, there is no reason to believe that in the longer run, the industry pool of profits or revenue will erode. Uh, so it's something that we are keeping a watch on because this is an evolving situation, very early stage for India. Uh, but looking at international trends, it would be a change in the industry without probably affecting the entire profit pool of the industries, how we are uh, looking at it. All right, Arnab, pleasure having you. Thank you so much for sparing time and joining us to take us through your views on the entire consumption sector. Now, time for a short break here on Halftime Report. Get you a chart check on the other side as to where the Nifty is headed now after this 1,000-point move from Thursday's low. Sudeep Shah of SBI Securities joins in.
India is such an important uh, part of AMD. When we look across our, you know, all of our uh, you know, global portfolio, it's been a remarkable experience. I mean, if you think about all of the things that have changed over the last 10 years.